Beloved, I attract your attention once again to the book of Genesis, once again the fifth chapter. But this time I highlight for our preaching portion verses 25 through 27 as we continue to look at this series of revisiting our roots. That's Genesis chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Hear now the word of the Lord. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived after the birth of Melech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Thus ends the reading of the word, amen. I want to put a tag on this text and talk just for a few fleeting moments from the subject, hidden significance. Right. Hidden significance. Our character today, Methuselah, has the distinction, the unique distinction, of being the oldest living person ever recorded in the biblical record. Methuselah lived 969 years. One would expect that kind of longevity to be rewarded and that one would also expect that there might be a Genesis world record plaque hanging on Methuselah's wall. However, what we find in the history of biblical interpretation and the sermonic registry is a less than favorable depiction of Methuselah. Most of the sermonic uh, discourse and the history of interpretation has centered around simply the fact that Methuselah lived and he died. That's it, he lived and he died. But when I look at this passage of scripture, I, I think we should be a little more sympathetic and a little more lenient on old man Methuselah because there is an unfair reductionist and revisionist tendency that is taking place in the text. His contribution has been too narrowly confined, consigned to the prison of performance. In other words, Methuselah is known by what he did. He lived and he died. We have no idea of what happened between his birth and his death. Uh, very little information is known about his life. And whenever we begin to flatten personalities, as we do in a reductionist and revisionist tendency for historical analysis, we don't get the full benefit of a complete portrait of the individual. How did Methuselah feel? What did Methuselah think? Where did Methuselah work? How many wives did Methuselah have? Did he go to school? Did he graduate? Did he drop out? We know nothing of Methuselah except what the text tells us, and that has simply been that he lived and he died. And when we get flattened portraits of, pic of people and communities and cultures, they can become easily manipulated by those who are in power. For we then only tell those stories about individuals that are serviceable to the dominant narrative of the day. Here, that's why we see in our culture even now that the dominant society reduces our story as, as children of Africa to the contributions of those seminal figures who uphold the serviceable narrative of the exceptionalism of America. And those African Americans that are selected for spotlighting are those who again undergird the narrative of American exceptionalism. That's why they know our singers, but they don't know our scientists. They know our dancers, 
but they don't know our doctors. They know our entertainers, but they do not have any clue of our entrepreneurs. And even we ourselves need to broaden our view of our own history. For we are the only people on the face of the planet that accounts and accords our history by the first. I remember the late Maynard Jackson say that he was always introduced as the first black mayor of Atlanta. We are the only people that recognize and accord our history, not as a series of events of cause and and, and sequence, but we are people that likes to look at our history from those seminal figures who have done something important. And so we know about Martin Luther King and, and Ralph Abernathy, but we know very little of Diane Nash and Ella Baker, which has an incomplete his portrait of our history. We know about political powerhouses like Marion Barry and Carl Stokes and Barack Obama, but we don't know about Shirley Chisholm, Carol Mosley Braun, and Barbara Jordan. We know about preachers who have it shaped the community like Richard Allen and Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, but we do not know about Jarena Lee, Julia Foote, and Katie Cannon. It is because we have flattened characters and incomplete portraits of the history. And that's why this passage becomes so poignant as a recovery act to a, bit, a, a disservice to Methuselah. For while the sermonic registry and the hermeneutic history of interpretation simply says that Methuselah lived and died, the text tells us otherwise. The poignant possibility of the passage is that Methuselah did more than just live and die. The text says at 187 years old, which many of you might say is a little late in life to have a baby, but he fathers a child by the name of Lamech. He did something that mattered. His life mattered. And I put you on notice today, beloved, that every life matters. Black lives matter. White lives matter. Democratic lives matter. Republican lives matter. Conservative lives matter. Con progressive lives matter. Straight lives matter. And queer lives matter. All lives matter. And that's why we ought not to have any difficulty saying that black lives matter when black life is imperiled. When police can come into your home while you sleep innocently on a couch and kill you, we should have no trouble saying black lives matter. When we can find ourselves on the short end of the healthcare system, we should have no trouble declaring that black lives matter. And on and on, we should have no trouble with saying that our lives matter because we have been made in the image and likeness of a loving God. Yes, we can say black lives matter when that life is in peril. So I put you on notice today that your life matters. No matter who you are, no matter what your job, no matter how unheralded your life may be, you may never be in anybody's history book. You may not make the front pages of the Washington Post. You may never become a pop-up online, but I'm here to tell you that your life indeed matters. Let me see if I can't put some things, some legs on this thing so that it walks through the corridors of your consciousness. There is a play by Douglas Turner Ward entitled The Day of Absence. And the opening scene of The Day of Absence is that there is trash piled up everywhere. On an urban scene, there are clothes on the line everywhere. And there is the sound of screeching and screaming babies everywhere and the reason that the trash is piled up the clothes are on the line and the babies are crying is because there are no black people there's nobody to tend to the children nobody to take care of the clothes nobody to pick up the trash what 
would this world be without us? What would this world be without you? So beloved, your life indeed matters. For colored girls who have contemplated suicide, your life matters. For black boys who have lost their joy, your life matters. For black girls who no longer feel magical, your life matters. For single parents working two and three jobs just to make ends meet, your life Life matters for young students being bullied in school and told that you don't matter because you're different. You don't wear the right clothes. Your life matters for the returning citizen who's struggling to reestablish a solid foundation with family and community. I'm here to put you on notice. Your life matters. Every life matters. And your value is not predicated upon the car you drive, the zip code in which you live nor the type of job you have your life and worth is not determined by the number of likes or shares or followers on social media but your life is important because there's a God who looked beyond your faults and saw your needs there's a God who looked beyond your problem and saw your potential there's a God who saw your dilemma but also saw your destiny that that's why you are important to life and to the world. Your life matters. And here is where we have to shed greater light on the passage. For the text does not say that, 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 that uh, Methuselah simply lived and died, but he had a son and other children, and the, pro the firstborn of the clan was a brother by the name of Lamech. Now, Lamech may not be a memorable character. Many of you may not have ever heard of Lamech, but I tell you, Lamech is important because Methuselah fathered Lamech and Lamech fathered Noah. And Noah was the family and the person that God used to preserve life during and after the great flood. I'm here to tell you that when you get caught up in God's eternal plans for your life, there's a role that only you can play. Uh, there's a song that only you can sing. There's a testimony that only you can give. There's a sermon that only you can preach. There's a life that only you can touch based on your life experiences. I'm here to tell you your life does indeed matter because all of us have what I call pebble possibilities. If you've ever dropped a pedal, pebble into the water, you know that the ripple effects go further than the initial percussive impact. Your life is significant beyond its present moment. When you yield to God's plans, God memorializes your worth. No, you may not ever make it in the history books. May You may not ever go down in history, but I'm here to tell you that if you do something for the Lord, it will last and count to your credit. Uh, that's what the old songwriter meant when he said, only what you do for Christ will will last. And I'm so glad that this has relevance because ordinary people, when they comply with the creator, can do extraordinary things. Uh, a little boy by the name of David with nothing but five smooth stones and a slingshot had enough to take down the arch enemy uh, Goliath of the dreaded Philistines. A little boy with a happy meal of just five loaves and two, fi uh, two fish and five loaves, but he gave it to Jesus. And when Jesus took it, blessed it, prayed over it, split it, it fed 5,000. Yes, I'm glad that they're ordinary people when they connect with God can do extraordinary things because there was a little poor girl on the outlier community in Israel. Her name was Mary. She was a virgin, but she had an available uh, body and she gave it to the Lord who produced the Christ child. Yes, ordinary people can do extraordinary, extraordinary things for a time.
hired seamstress sat down on a bus in Montgomery and a whole people stood up and started marching. An ordinary people can do extraordinary things when they connect with the creator. A young Palestinian Jew who showed an old rugged cross and died a criminal's death. But it was enough to save you and me and the whole world throughout all of eternity. Yes, extraordinary things can happen when ordinary people get right with God and do it now. And additionally, when we ponder the power of percussion, we recognize that we are crafting our futures right now. When we co-labor with God, we have the capacity to change the trajectory of communities and institutions and even our own families. So beloved, you can do something. You're never helpless, you're never hapless, you're never hopeless because your life has significance. Do something rather than complain do something rather than sit on the sidelines do something rather than just let time go by do something with your gifts that God has given you do something to touch another life and change the trajectory of somebody else's life so sing your best song preach your best sermon write your best poem balance your books as if you were a fine artist painting on an un, untouched canvas. Do something in life because you're making memories right now. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your gifts. Don't waste the gift of a day but do something and when you do something to help somebody else and participate in God's plan, your life has a memorial though it may not go down in history. God will recognize that there's one of my children that's doing what I need them to do. There's one of my children that's going about doing good. There's one of my children that's touching the lives of others and sharing the good news of the kingdom. There's one of my children. Do something. Don't just waste your gifts, your times, your treasures, and your talents, but do something to help somebody else as you pass along, for your life has a hidden significance. Yes, beloved, as I look back over my life, those who have participated in my existence, even with the most simplest of gestures, have made a great and meaningful impact and significance. I like to tell the story often, and you've heard me tell it, but it bears telling again of Miss Ella Nache Grimes, who was one of the secretarial staff at the Samuel DeWitt School, uh, Proctor School of Theology, when my when during my matriculation there. And the last semester of my studies. I was $760 short from being able to pay my tuition and graduate on time. I told no one of my dilemma. I suffered in silence. I prayed fervently, but I told nobody of what I needed because I was $760 short. One day I passed by Miss Grimes' office and she called me tenderly into her office and said, son, sign this. I said, what am I signing? She said, don't worry about that. I was reluctant because my daddy taught me never sign anything without reading it first. She said, sign this. And because of who Miss Grimes was, I was obedient in the moment and I signed unknowingly and unwittingly a sheet of paper. A few days later, she said, they need you in the Bursar's office. And I went down dreadfully to the Bursar's office knowing that I'm $760 short of being able to pay my tuition. When I got there, they said, Reverend Victor, we need you to sign for your check. I said, what check? She said, Miss Grimes, send down paperwork. 
and you got a scholarship here for seven hundred and sixty dollars won't God move in your life by sending somebody that'll do something in your life I'm glad she did something I'm glad she made a way for me to graduate on time I'm glad that she was obedient to the Lord moving in her life I'm glad that she found a way for me to move forward because she did something and I'm so glad as I take my seat that there was another one who did something when he discovered that I was short and lacking I'm glad he did something for he came unadorned though he was a king I'm glad he did something he came unheralded by the powers that be though his birth was announced by angels I'm glad he did something for he came as an impoverished child though the earth and the fullness thereof rightfully belonged to him I'm glad he did something for he opened blinded eyes though they still could not see his majesty I'm glad he did something for he raised the dead though they locked in a life I'm glad he did something for he shouldered up an old rugged cross though he was innocent of all of the charges in order to drop the charges he died Till abundant life became the prize of creation. He did something. He died until one born out of time could become a new creation in him. He died outside the city gates so that the gates of heaven could be thrust open wide. He died. Yes, he died. He died so that I might have a right to a tree called life. He died. Do you know he died? His name is Jesus. And I'm here to tell you he died. He died so that we could live. He died so that we could rise and have the power of a resurrection people. He died. Yes, he died. Oh, he died. And because he died, I've now got a power. Because he died, I've got joy down on the inside that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. He did something when he died so that I met him one Thursday night in a revival meeting. He died and now has become my all in all. If you don't know him, let me introduce you. His name is Jesus and Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would surely fall. Jesus is all the world to me. I wouldn't give nothing for my journey right now. But without him, I'm like a ship without a sail. But with him, I'm a child on my way to destiny. Without him, I don't have any ancestry. But with him, I've got a birth certificate in the kingdom of the living God. Without him, I'm, a, I'm just to and fro on the sea of life. But with him, I've got a purpose that precedes my existence. Yes, he did something and my job now and your job now 
is to change that significance and make everybody know he's still alive. He's still doing good. He's still healing. He's still raising. Yes, Jesus. I said Jesus. He's all the world. So beloved, though your life may seem on the surface bland, ordinary, and unheralded by the structures that connotate and denotate, or denote, connote and denote, history and value your life has worth so I invite you to partner today with God and thereby be enabled to do something significant for when we play a part in law in God's larger plan we may not always know how that works, but the Lord sees our contribution. So if you are in need of moorings, of anchors, of foundations, I submit to you, call that number at the bottom of your screen. Someone is waiting to share the good news with you and receive you into the kingdom of God and into the body of Christ. We invite you to come now. For those of you who have prayer requests, we ask that you would make them known in the chat and we will pray for them momentarily as a sacred act of ministerial responsibility. Whomsoever will, let him or her come. Sure. 